record to the cloud. We want to welcome all those folks who are going to be watching this on our YouTube channel. Uh, we trust that the message will inspire you and give you encouragement and hope uh, today and make your life better in so many ways in the weeks ahead. Janet, if you would bring our scripture passage today, please. Okay, this is from the New International Version. It's Psalm chapter 19. Um, for the director of music, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warmed. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and these meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord my rock and my redeemer. These are the words of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Janet. You can just mute yourself now. That would be great. Yep. Perfect. Let's make sure that we've got the speaker view here. Yes. A few weeks back, uh, Connie and I were out camping just north of Comox Courtney in this part of Vancouver Island. And uh, it was 10 o'clock at night. And I was taking the dog out for his final little walk around. And uh, I happened to look up at the night sky and it took my breath away because it was a clear night. And because we were a distance away from the city lights of Courtney Comox, the ambient light was way down low. And I could see thousands of stars kind of winking back at me. Here I was this, on this lonely planet or the little planet Earth and all these beautiful stars in the heavens were twinkling at me and I took in its wonder and glory. Um, I was speechless and I naturally turned to thank the one who created the heavens above me and I thank God that I could see the stars so clearly that night. Uh, the psalmist nailed it when he wrote and we heard it, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of God's hands. You know, I could have stayed there for some time, staring in awe at the beauty, majesty, and wonder of the skies above me. I'm sure all of you have seen some of the incredible pictures taken from the Hubble Space Telescope of the solar system and all of the uh, skies around us. Far, far into the distant universe, the Hubble Telescope has been uh, looking and taking pictures for a few decades. It's incredible to see. Some years back, I found an article that gave me a perspective on our own little solar system. And I thought that on this week when we celebrated Earth Day, we could use a primer to help expand our vision for the universe and the gift of our own planet. Just before I get to my main point, let me ask, if it were possible to travel the speed of light, do you know how long it would take you to arrive at the moon if you went from Earth at the speed of light? Only a second and a half. Actually, it's a second and one third. But going at the speed of light 
how long would it take you to travel that same distance to our closest star? Well, it's four years. Hard to believe. Now, I want you to imagine that you're on a glass plane and you can see for a long, long distance. And at the center, if you were able to shrink the sun, which is the diameter of 1,392,000 kilometers, if you could shrink the diameter of the sun into the size of a two foot medicine ball, and you kind of put it right in the center, right at your feet. And then you walked 82 paces away and you put a small little tiny mustard seed at that point to represent the first planet. That's Mercury. Take 60 more paces for Mercury and for the planet Venus, put down a small BB. 70 more, 78 more paces and put down a P to represent our little planet, Earth. 108 more paces for Mars, which you represent with a tiny grain of sand. Take 788 more steps for Jupiter and you place down an orange because it's a larger planet. 934 more paces, you put down a golf ball for Saturn. And then you keep walking 2,089 more steps and you put down a marble, marble for Uranus. And then you keep walking 2,322 more steps, a market with a cherry to represent Neptune. Finally, we walk a further 2,000 paces to Pluto. Now, I know that they downgraded it from a planet, but when I went to school, it was still a planet. And you put a small, small, tiny grain of sand down there. It's really just a speck. And you've got our solar system. Now, if you had binoculars and you could look back to the center where you first placed that medicine ball, two foot diameter, do you know how far you would have walked? you would have walked five and a half kilometers. It's about as far from, if you could imagine in this area, going from the Qualcomm town center where the diameter of the sun has been shrunk to that ball. And as the crow flies going to our church in Coombs, that's the distance you would have walked to put all of those planets in their different places. That gives you a size or, or some perspective on our solar system. Now, let me ask you this. How far would you have to walk to get to the closest star? Remember, it's four light years away. But given that kind of the parameters that we said with the medicine ball and so on and so forth out to Coombs for our solar system, how far would you have to go to get to the nearest star? You'd have to go all the way to Jerusalem, nearly 11,000 kilometers to get to our closest star. Do you start to understand why David would say when he looked up at the heavens, it revealed God's glory? He couldn't conceive, and we can't really conceive of distances like that. We can't conceive of the amount of energy and mass in the sun, in the planets, all the forces around. It takes your breath away just conceiving of all of the magnitude and glory that is in the universe around us. And so we when we take time to appreciate and contemplate the world and universe around us, we're doing what the songwriter David did all those thousands of years ago. We're proclaiming God's glory and giving God thanks for the universe and our place in it. N.T. Wright, who I often quote, says the word glory refers to anything and everything that reflects or embodies that strange, powerful, hard to pin down sense of something more, something greater, something more intimate than you would get from a chemical or mathematical analysis of the world and expanse of space. It's that something that you can't grasp, but you know you're on the edge of something magnificent when you think of the heavens above us. Now, scientists can give us great insights into the age of the universe. The chemical compounds and physical laws and forces that keep everything in the universe and on our planet in balance. They can tell us about the ecosystem of the forests, the prairie lands of oceans and skies. They can remind us of the rising temperatures of our planet and warn us of the impending dangers of climate change. Yet, even all the warnings and facts 
don't always move us to action to do and to assume responsibility that we have individually for care of creation. But in fact, our Hebrew Christian faith calls us, perhaps even commands us, to care for the world that has been created and gift to, gifted to us by a loving, ever-present God. On June 18, 2015, Pope uh, Francis did something never before done by any of his predecessors. He issued an encyclical addressed not just to Catholics, but to all people on this planet. It was an encyclical about ecology. Now, encyclicals are basically a letter from the Pope to members of the Catholic faith, and they contain the Pope's view on church teachings and doctrines, particular areas of theology. But this letter, this encyclical, was different from any before it because the, spoke, the Pope spoke directly about the climate crisis facing all humanity. And here's a little bit of what he said in that encyclical. He said and wrote, the ecological crisis is a summons to profound interior conversion. It must be said that some committed and prayerful Christians, with the excuse of realism and pragmatism, tend to ridicule expressions of concern for the environment. Others are passive. They choose not to change their habits and thus become inconsistent. So what they all need is an ecological conversion whereby the efforts of their encounter with Jesus Christ become evident in their relationship with the world around them, living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of active Christian faith. I hope you agree with that. An ecological conversion is a new term for me, but it's an apt one because I think I've become complacent and often take for granted all the gifts of nature around me. I, like many Canadians, just assume the mountains and rivers, the expanse of prairies and farmlands, our abundant forests and lakes and oceans will be there in their pristine beauty and uh, power and abundance forevermore. But of course, this is simply a myth because the state of our planet is in some sense in a crisis state. Perhaps it helps to go back to our beginnings to refresh our minds of our Hebrew Christian faith and traditions. And of course the scriptures talk about God creating the world. In Genesis 1 and 2 we hear the poem, this poetry basically, an artist's impression of how God brought all things into being through the spoken word and the divine kind of creative mind that was able to conceive and then the power to speak all of the worlds in the universe into being. Now, when you go back to the first chapters, you start to get an understanding of God's creative power, but also what God has gifted to us and what God calls us to do. Now, Here's a bit of a trick question. What is the oldest profession in the world? I know what most of you are thinking, but in actual fact, the oldest profession is landscape gardening. Because the biblical story says that once God created the heavens and the earth and created all of the living creatures and all of nature here on the planet, he created human beings, men and women, in God's image, in that spiritual image of God, they were created. And then God gives them a beautiful garden and God gives them a command. And here's the words from Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the humans and put them in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. Author and Christian theologian Leonard Sweet has done a word study on those true prime directives given to Adam and Eve in the garden. To work and to take care. He says that these words in the Hebrew language connote guard from harm and protect from peril. God created us in part to guard and protect the planet. So God's original dream for creating human life was for everything to flourish. But to accomplish that, people needed to assume responsibility to care for, guard for, and protect creation. But of course, we know it's not as simple in the 21st century where our society has benefited from all the bounty of our natural resources, not just here in Canada, but around the world. 
The natural world has produced wealth for our citizens so that we can enjoy the comforts of health care, policing, pension checks, social safety nets for many of the poorest people. Upcoming, it'll be daycare for all the people who want it, and so much more. Now, we sometimes worry that our prosperity might be affected if we have to pay more taxes to save the environment. Or we might think that our small individual efforts really can't make a difference when faced with the global crisis challenge. But in truth, all of us have to shoulder some of the responsibility to look after the planet and to care for creation as we seek God's dream for all creation, for all people, for all creatures. Brian McLaren is one of my favorite uh, authors who's a pastor, theologian, and prolific writer. One of uh, the most insightful books he's written is called Everything Must Change. He wrote it probably at least a decade ago. And he was warning about the impending crises, not just the ecological crises, but a few others as well. And it's a great work, uh, masterfully crafted by a devoted Christian. I want to read uh, a little bit. But, but the jacket cover says, how do the life and teachings of Jesus address the most critical global problems in our world today? Because he believes that the Christian gospel message, particularly of Jesus, actually has great wisdom for those of us who live in the 21st century, who are facing all of these crises around us, including the pandemic. <clears throat> I want to read just a little bit from his book. Here's what he writes. For Jesus' followers, to believe in him meant and means not only that we have faith in Jesus, but also that we share the faith of Jesus. We know that our world is, in a, is on a suicidal trajectory and that our lives can make a difference. While most of us won't be called to sacrifice our physical lives, having faith in Jesus and sharing the faith of Jesus will lead all of us to make what an early disciple called a living sacrifice. We will give up the life we could have lived, the life we would have lived, pursuing pleasure, leisure, treasure, security, whatever. And instead, we will live a life dedicated to replacing the suicide machine with a sacred ecosystem, a beautiful community, an insurgency of healing and peace, a creative global family, an, a, a movement of faith, hope, and love. These are some of the things that he believes we can do because he believes that Jesus gives us a mandate to care for one another, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love God, and even to care for the planet. I think McLaren is right in his assessment of the great challenges of our times. The truth is there are no quick fixes to the problems we're facing on this planet. But a vibrant 21st century Christian faith, which I'm preaching on in this series, must wrestle with the challenges and with the person and message of Jesus and the scripture readings that remind us that the planet that we live on and inhabit was created by God and that God gives us responsibility to care for it, to protect it. And so we must ask, what are we as followers of Jesus called to do individually? collectively as communities of faith, and of course, citizens of the world. Now, saving the planet is too big a challenge for any of us to really consider tackling. But we can recognize that all of us can do some things to become better gardeners and caretakers of the places where we live. Recycling and paying our fair share of carbon taxes or finding new ways to reduce greenhouse gases are obvious ways for us to do our individual part. But there's more we need to do as individuals when we think of those beyond our borders who are more impacted by our consumption habits and the global, win global warming trends. And that's why I want to invite Bern and Nancy into the conversation. So Bern and Nancy, if you would unmute yourselves. Because as I was crafting my message today, I was thinking, of course, we have a global responsibility not just to care for our own communities, but also to care for those who are being hurt most of all by the rising climate change problems. So, where are you, Nancy and Byrne? We're here. We're here. All right. Nancy and Byrne, tell 
our group here just a little bit about the work that you did in Africa and and then I'll bring it back to why it makes such a difference for us to be engaged in these kinds of things to help the poorest of the poor. Go ahead, please. Okay, and I'm gonna start off by saying we did not intend to save the planet or, or do anything special. We, we're, we're offshore sailors. Our dream is to sail offshore. So after working 27 years in the Arctic, we decided early retirement was for us and uh, we were going to sail offshore. And so uh, Bern resigned and uh, one phone call changed everything. One phone call and we ended up, um, Bern took a two year contract in Samoa in the tropics. So we went north of the Arctic Circle to the equator, one phone call. So at the end of two years, now we're ready to sail but um, there was a little bit of a crisis up in the office in Yellowknife and Byrne was asked to go back. So back to Yellowknife he went and off to England I went. And then we finished doing what we were doing and ready to sail again. And each time we attempted to sail, something happened. So uh, we finally got ready and the boat was ready to go and we were taking a break and we went to the Civic Center at Qualicum Beach. And there was a water conference. David Suzuki's daughter was presenting. And the whole weekend was about how um, the situation in Mexico is very, very bad. They need water. And we walked away from there saying to ourselves, boy, we have to do something about this situation. We really do. And in our mind, Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. The following weekend, we went to a craft fair, world craft fair at Knox United Church and ACTS, Africa Community Technical Service, had a booth and they were selling fabric and all kinds of things, African. And there was a DVD playing showing their water projects. And so water was really hitting us. And I said to the fellow, um, so do you need volunteers? And he said, yes, we do. And um, he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a teacher. He said, oh, that's nice. I said, but my husband's an engineer. And they said, where's your husband? Get him, bring him here. So Byrne came over, the director was in the building. We had this chat and it seemed that we might think about going to Africa. In the meantime, we had a little health problem. Byrne had an aneurysm and you know, several things got in the way and it wasn't going to happen. To cut to the chase, everything turned out all right. And we needed, we needed one more, I guess, sign, signal that we were meant to go there. On Sunday, we went to church and two hymns we sung that day. And I can't, um, I can't believe how it solidified our commitment to this. And you may know this. Um, the first one is, um, Jesus, you have come to the lake shore, looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones. You only asked me to humbly follow. Oh, Jesus, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By <coughs> your side, I will seek other seas. Well, I looked at Vernon, he looked at me, and we thought, wow, wow, is this God speaking to us? And the final hymn of the day was, Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. So off to Uganda, we went for six months, thinking that was it, but somehow we returned eight more times and we officially retired from overseas volunteer work in 2015, but God still might have other plans. So I'll turn it over to Byrne to tell you exactly what he did when he was there. Okay, I'll keep it, I'll keep it brief as I can. 
Um, Pax, your after screen, Burn, we got to see your face. Oh. <laughs> Vanishing here. Um, their focus was to provide clean water to uh, rural villages or remote villages in uh, Uganda. So uh, before we uh, arrived to do our projects, getting water was, was a chore, it was a burden. Women and children had to walk often more than five kilometers to swamps, polluted streams, carrying water back home. They'd carry it in uh, five gallon jerry cans and uh, it was filthy water. Uh, really dirty water. So there was a lot of uh, intestinal uh, disease, waterborne diseases. Uh, the burden of carrying water took hours, as you can imagine. For a family, they, they needed three or four trips a day to get the water. So this, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. This is a, this is a young girl. She's carrying the jerry can on her back there. Uh, she had to live in a mountainous area, so she had to climb up very steep hills, and the whole family was doing this. Um, there's another group of people all carrying these five gallon jerry cans on their heads, and these weigh 50 pounds, eh? five gallons of water, day after day after day. So uh, that meant that women couldn't work in the fields, they couldn't help produce food for the family. Children couldn't go to school because they were carrying water all day long. Uh, then after we were able to complete a water project, things changed incredibly. There was no more, well, very little waterborne illnesses. Women had time to work in the, in the fields, to help their husbands, to grow food, to make a little more income from the families. And uh, what happened? Uh, children could go to school. One surprising thing we found was that uh, they could build more houses because they, they had mud houses. And mud houses need lots of water to make the mud. And if you have to carry it from five or six kilometers away to make your mud, you don't go very often. So you get three or four families or generations of families We lost Bern and Nancy. Uh, okay, we're still here. Oh, good. So generations of families used to live in one tiny hut, mud hut. Now with the water so close at hand, they could build more houses, which meant people could move out from their family home and build their own home, which uh, certainly increased the uh, health situation in the communities too. Um, during the, uh, the projects, we were able to train the local people how to look after the, the water system, uh, how to keep the jerry cans, all the containers clean so there was no more disease. We built uh, perhaps 30 kilometers of pipeline in six months. We put a tap stand close to each church, close to each school, and as close as we could get 500 meters for every family in the area. Now, that sounds like a long way to go, 500 meters to go and get the five gallon jerry can of water. But uh, to these people, it was, it was a life-changing event. Now, uh, can you imagine one tap had to provide water for about 150 people. So they would line up and uh, gaily line up, happily line up to get their jerry can of water and then uh, take it home. But it, it took away the burden, the drudgery of traipsing back and forth from the swamp with this filthy water. So we were, uh, we were blessed to have been able to do this. So over, over a period of time, uh, in the time that we were there, over about eight, eight or nine years, we probably got clean water to about 250,000 people because one project would get water to maybe 12 to 20,000 people. And we did quite a few projects. All gravity flow, very low technology, but uh, it changed the lives of these villagers incredibly. 
Wow, that is amazing. Now, Nancy, I know that's not the end of the story. Oh, oh I hadn't planned on talking about this. Um, they didn't know what to do with me. So the night before we got on the plane, the director from Comox said, I would become a disc jockey. And um, I would um, go climb this hill every night and um, give a tape recorded message to the Ugandan disc jockey. And um, he would play this, this tape telling the villagers uh, when they had to go out and dig the pipeline. My job was also to go out to the villages and get messages and greetings and things like this and fill up the tape and bring it up to him. And then just as I was leaving the airport, um, the director said, and yes, you will set up an education program. I had no idea what he was talking about, but when I got there, um, I set up an education program uh, uh, and uh, an NGO, or not an NGO, a company in Western Canada called Urban Systems. They gave money to Axe and Axe um, uh, had me set up a program whereby we chose children in the water project area, students from P7, no high schools in any of these villages. So I got the lovely job of selecting 15 children each year for equal number of girls and boys to go to secondary school and beyond. And so we ended up with 125 in the program. And over the years, over the um, eight years that we were there, uh, we saw many of them through and we have lots of masons and carpenters and secretaries, nurses. We have a pharmacist in Kampala who owns his own business, all kinds, lots of teachers. And it was just an amazing, an amazing gift uh, and a privilege to be able to, to do this work um, thanks to all of the employees at Urban Systems who contributed um, part of their um, earnings each month to support this program for these children. Wow, that is an amazing story. I, I hope that uh, in the future, we'll be able to sit down and see some slides uh, from your adventures in Africa. Now, the reason why I wanted to have Vern and Nancy share this is because global warming affects the poorest of the poor more than it affects those of us in rich nations, right? We can mitigate a, against a lot of the problems just because we have money. But poor people, as Vern and Nancy witnessed firsthand, they have no financial resources in comparison to what we have to get water to villages, to even educate their children and their teenagers. And so when people like Vernon and Nancy and NGOs and other agencies go and do these things, it's actually helping with the global warming problem, which is affecting adversely more and more uh, sub-Saharan communities and communities in, uh, around the equator, particularly developing nations that are very, very poor we can do something about that. We have the financial capacity to help some of those people mitigate against some of the great, great problems caused by global warming. So we have to do our part here in our community, but we can contribute and do things that help NGOs and other agencies, whether it's Kiva. Kiva is a great agency that helps thousands and thousands of of women and uh, small entrepreneurs to get a kind of a foothold to start their own businesses or to start co-ops. Uh, World Vision, Compassion, any number of agencies can help do some of the heavy lifting in, in rural areas and some of the most difficult places uh, on our planet. So I wanna encourage you to be kind of like Vern and Nancy. You don't necessarily have to get uh, the call all the time as they got to go to distant lands, but you can do something to make the world a better place, particularly for those who are poor. Now, the answer to the crisis we're facing, of course, aren't easy answers. They'll demand tough choices for us all, especially for richer nations who have benefited most from industrial and technological changes over the last 150 years. But part of the solution must surely be remembering our founding story, that God created this world and universe, and he placed humanity in the middle of it all to care and protect and tend his creation. We need to spend more time recognizing God's glory around us and above us. 
and we must make individual choices to become more like Jesus in being generous with our time, our talents and resources to help those with so much less. I wanna end with the quote from Brian McLaren, very last paragraphs of his book. He says, it's interesting, astonishing really, that Jesus doesn't simply say, nothing will be impossible for me or nothing will be impossible with God. In, instead, Jesus says, nothing will be impossible for you. This is our call to action, our invitation to move mountains and to reshape the social and spiritual landscape of our world. Yes, change is, is impossible through human efforts alone, but faith brings God's creative power into our global crises so that the impossible first becomes possible and then inevitable for those who believe. Mountains can be moved and everything can change, beginning with our lives, beginning with faith, beginning now, beginning with us. Thanks to Bern and Nancy for sharing a little bit of their story with us today. Would you just bow your heads and pray with me? God, thank you for, for your creation, but also that you've given us the means by which we can care for creation. The choices are not easy, I understand that. But Christians have been faced with crises before, and our faith demands that we do what we can to bring help, and healing and hope to the people around us and even those who are far away. When we do things like Bern and Nancy were sharing, that's really loving our neighbor. And so I pray God that you'll inspire each of us to hear your voice, to, to decipher the signs around us so that we know what we can do. And we know what you're calling us to do so that we can have a more sustainable planet and do our part to build a better world, not just for us here in Canada, but for others around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to uh, share the screen as we stop the recording.